You know, Paul, the local high school is having a menopause seminar. All right. There will, be, there will be a demenstruation after last period. You know, so to the, to the <laughs> listeners, we were going to have dueling puns, and I, I'm jumping ship. I am not going to be any part of this. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly Cash Like More Hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Uh, welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, here with America's primary care physician, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Paul, how are you? I'm good, Matt. How are you doing? I'm great. Uh, obviously, based on the pun that we opened with, we are going to be talking about menopause. Specifically, It'd be so weird if we weren't. <laughs> tonight, we're going to be <laughs> Sorry, talking- Sorry, ankle pain exercise. Ankle pain. Yep, there you go. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about hormonal and non-hormonal therapy for vasomotor symptoms of menopause. Uh, we have a great returning guest, Dr. Monica Christmas. Uh, she is an expert on all things menopause and uh, really just had so many great tips. So really excited for people to hear this. But Paul, uh, before we get to that, could you tell the audience what exactly is it that we do on the Curbsiders? Sure, Matt. As a reminder to our audience, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Um, and as you mentioned, Matt, we had a great conversation with Dr. Monica Christmas. Shall I remind our audience who it is that we talked to? That would, that would be fantastic, Paul. I'd love to hear her bio. She is an associate professor and director of the Menopause Program and Center for Women's Integrated Health in the section of minimally invasive gynecologic surgery at the University of Chicago Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. I think I got all the words in there. She is on the <laughs> Board did. of Trustees for the North American Menopause Society and is on the International Comma, which is Core Outcomes in Menopause, and the capitalization there is surprising. <laughs> and also the MAPS, the Menopause <laughs> Priority Setting Partnership, which she talks about later in the episode, Steering Committee. She is a tireless advocate and a pioneer championing the need to better understand unanswered questions about the optimal management of menopause in racially and ethically diverse populations. In this episode, Dr. Christmas talks us through um, various options for the symptoms of menopause, so the vasomotor symptoms and, and even the, the genital urinary symptoms of menopause, and when to consider hormone therapy, which might be more often than you think, how long to treat, what formulations to go with, what our options are what the contraindications are. So I feel like, I don't know about you, Matt, but I feel like I have a much better framework overall as to oh, yeah. approaching a topic that made me a little bit anxious, I think, before we talked to Dr. Christmas. And Paul, I did want to remind the audience that uh, this episode will be available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And one last thing, Paul, we we have a Patreon now and uh, people can join our, our Cashlack family if they want to get bonus episodes, if they want to hear all the episodes ad-free, uh, our whole catalog, Paul. And, uh, and we also have a Discord, which is a place where it's kind of like a, a private forum for curbsider super fans. We're on there answering questions, interacting with the audience. Uh, people should people should join if uh, that sounds like something that would be fun to them or if they just you know don't care for the ads in the episode or if they just want bonus content, extra two extra episodes a month on on the Patreon there. Anything to say about that, Paul? No, I mean, the Discord part's cool. Like, it's it's nice to be able to interact with with our listeners. And, it, like, I, I think they run cases past each other. We talk about sort of a lot of non-medical stuff in terms of book and, and movie recommendations. So it's it's just it's a fun space to, to hang out. So if that's appealing to you at all, uh, I would strongly encourage you to sign up. All right. And with all that, let's get to the episode. All right, Monica, we've been talking for a while here. You're, you're a previous guest on the show. We're so glad to have you back. But in case people didn't hear the first time around, tell people what's like a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine that you wanted to share with them. I am a yoga enthusiast and I love reading on the beach. Nothing medical, of course. Um, and Good choice. I would, yeah. And, and adding to my, my beach time, I love walking on the beach and listening to audio books in addition to my yoga. So. Yeah. Any, how about a recent audio book that you've enjoyed? I am thoroughly enjoying it, but I have to say it really is impacting my mood and making me sad, but I'm listening to the goldfinch <laughs> right now. Um, oh yeah. 
Uh, and I, I love reading. So I have, um, if it, a book makes it to my bookshelf, that means I've read it already. But I have the ones that I haven't read yet in my room. And The Goldfinch has been one that I've been meaning to read and hadn't. So I decided, oh, it's warm. I've been walking every night. I'm going to listen to it. But man, it's kind of gut-wrenching. But it's so beautiful. So I, I had the same feeling. Uh, I, I didn't, I was reading it on like Kindle or something and I didn't realize how long it was. And I, and I was like, I feel like I've been reading this for months. Like when is this thing? But it is, yeah. If you are, if you are prone to melancholy, that book is just like, you know, you just, it, it can, it may add to your mood. Uh, but it is, it is very, it's a beautiful book. I agree. Longtime listeners may remember I, there was a year where I was trying to watch a, a new movie every single day. And as part of those, I was actually trying to include the movies in America Film Institute's top 100. And I just, I never made it to Sophie's Choice for that very reason. Like, I've just been kind of like, I know, I'm sure it's fantastic, but I just don't, <laughs> I'm waiting until I have the emotional reserve for it. And like, that day has yet to come. And that was like <laughs> six years ago. So Sophie's Choice, sorry, but I, I may not, I, I know how it turns out. Um, anyway, this is not about me. This is about you, Dr. Christmas. Let me ask a different type of question. Let me ask you about um, a piece of advice or feedback that you either given that you loved or that you love to give to your learners? Oh my. So you switched up the question a little bit. So I'm going to give you two answers, right? So um, initially, I think I thought of it as kind of what is a pearl about menopause and uh, this menopause transition. And uh, it takes me back to that expression that says health is wealth. And um, I always tell my patients, you cannot eat yourself out of no exercise and you can't eat your way out of, uh, no, you cannot eat your way out of no exercise and you can't exercise your way out of a bad diet. Uh, so that is my menopause pearl. And we'll talk more about why I'm saying that later. And then for me, especially as a physician, you too will appreciate this. Um, my first year out, I had um, just a colleague that was a, a mentor to me, actually a general surgeon. And he said to me after I was really, you know, just struggling with a, a patient case that I had, it was a, a outcome that I hadn't anticipated. And he told me that medicine was humbling. And no matter how perfect you are or how perfect you think the medicine is, things happen. And patients will understand if you are humble. And I've taken that with me now over the last 20 years. And I think he was right. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. Um for all the perfectionists listening and, uh, and <laughs> which is all of you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this is off to a great start, but Paul, we, we got to get to the topic of the day. So why don't you read us a case from cash Lack to get, to get things started? Sure. So Monica, we're going to talk about Ms. J. She is a 48 year old female with pure hypercholesterolemia with an ASCVD risk score of about 1.4%, like about, but I'm very, still very specific. Uh, she also <laughs> has obesity with a body mass index of 33. She's presenting with 12 months of amenorrhea and five to seven daily hot flashes, often accompanied by sweating. These symptoms have been really disruptive to her work and sleep. She knows that she doesn't want hormone therapy because she's read so many scary things. She did see a commercial about BMS on TV, and she'd like to discuss, all right, everyone wish me luck here, Vizalinitant. Um, she has no personal or family history of venous thromboembolism or breast cancer. She does not smoke tobacco. She reports that her father had an MI at age 72. So we were talking a little bit before we got started, you know, Matt and I, I think there's sometimes low grade terror among people uh, at this point to even prescribe any sort of medications. Um, I shouldn't say any medications, but hormone therapy specifically for vasomotor symptoms for menopause. Um, so I, I kind of like just to hear to start your sort of general take on so where where we are in terms of the world and medicine in terms of thinking about prescribing uh, hormone replacement therapy for for these symptoms. Is it is it good, bad, and different? And kind of where where is where in the pendulum swing are we right now? Yeah, excellent question. And so for this patient, I always like to go into these are what your options are, and we can talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, and then I let them know that. We can you can pick one and you don't actually have to be married to it. If it doesn't work, <laughs> you're gonna let me know because I'm gonna bring you back in a few weeks. I think usually eight weeks, eight to twelve weeks is a good time point to bring people back. And if we need to change, we can. So usually we'll tell them, hey, we're gonna start with lifestyle modifications, 
me counseling you. Now you're going to, you may decide that you want to jump straight to a prescription option, but we'll talk about, you know, what are the lifestyle modifications? What are some non-hormonal options? And then we'll go to the hormonal, hormonal options. And I think thinking about things, especially with somebody that has some fears about hormone therapy, gives them some autonomy, some power in the conversation. So, you know, many of the things that people are going to come in and ask you about, like black cohosh, uh, various vitamins, soy, all of, all of the, the herbal kind of things. And there's lots of stuff on the market. And the reality is, is that really none of that stuff has been shown to be better than placebo. And so, you know, I'll tell, if they come in and they're saying, I started this thing and I feel great, then as long as there's no contraindications, I'm not going to burst their bubble and take it away from them. Um, but if they're not using something, I have a hard time telling somebody to go spend their hard-earned money on something that probably isn't going to work. And so, and I'll explain to them what the placebo effect is and, and why it may not be as beneficial. Now, weight loss has been shown to help uh, minimize the severity and frequency of hot flashes, uh, although exercise has hasn't been, but you kind of need the exercise to get to the weight loss and exercise is good for so many other things. Uh, and then I counsel them about um, just healthy eating and the Mediterranean diet has been found in numerous studies over many years to be um, not only um, a, a great uh way of eating and is associated with decreased cardiovascular, decreased risk of diabetes, uh, decreased risk of osteoporosis even, and it's even associated with decreased risk of dementia. So um, I usually will give them some information about that and we, we talk about an exercise regimen. Um, and then I start moving into, you know, also too, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and hypnosis. And people kind of look at me like, well, how would cognitive behavioral therapy work? And I tell them, well, you know, part of it is that as soon as you have that hot flash, we many of us start to get worked up. I know I did when I was having them. It's like, oh my goodness, it's happening again. I start fanning myself. Um, woe is me. This is terrible, especially if it's happening in the middle of the night. Oh my goodness, my sleep is disrupted. And now I'm only going to have three hours of sleep and my hair is soaking wet. I don't have time to do it over in the morning. And, and that, that anxiety around it really does incite more of the hot flashes versus taking a deep breath, maybe drinking some cold water, throwing the covers off or wherever you are. You know, I, in my, when I'm in the office, I like putting a cold pack on my chest or my neck. Um, but just saying, I know what this is. It's going to pass. If my heart is racing a little bit, I know this is not a heart attack. This is kind of what happens. And it goes away. And I think those those cognitive behavioral therapies and even hypnosis, that's really, it's calming our central nervous system down. It's helping us to self-soothe. And so those things actually have been shown in randomized control trials to actually help too. So somebody is saying, you know what, that sounds great, Dr. Christmas, but not really into hypnosis, not going to do cognitive behavioral therapy. I am exercising and I've lost some weight and my hot flashes are still kicking my butt. What else you got, lady? So if we start talking about the non-hormone options in particular for this patient, there are certain antidepressants that used in low doses that have been shown to help minimize hot flashes and night sweats. Now, it's not perfect. It's not going to make them 100% go away. So we want to level set and, and help people with their expectations so that they don't think it's going to be 100% gone. Um, but certainly if it's their night sweats that are bothering them, many of the, the antidepressants that have been shown to be efficacious also may help with sleep too. Um, as well as if mood swings are an issue, they, they can help stabilize the mood. So that, that's a, a good option, especially in somebody that either has contraindications to hormone therapy or just doesn't want to be on it. Um, Gabapentin um, has also been shown, or Neurontin has been shown to, to help minimize hot flashes and night sweats as well. Um, there's some side effects with it. So sometimes you want to, you know, if, if they've got some other reasons for needing to be on the medication, um, then it's kind of a win because, hey, we can treat two things at once. Um, but if they don't, I usually do let them know with this, you know, you might feel a little sleepy or drowsy. So maybe it's better to take it at night. Um, but we could try it if that's something that if they, especially if they really want to avoid hormone therapy. Uh, you mentioned the newer medication, Fezolinotant, that was approved in May by the FDA. Uh, it has um, shown to, to actually have similar efficacy to um, hormone therapy. And in the past, we, we blamed everything on estrogen deficiency and didn't really think about what other things might trigger it. And so we have found that, yes, estrogen kind of drives the change as drop in estrogen, but it also stimulates 
the release of these neurokinins, these candy neurons. And it's actually those that seem to be disrupting our body's internal thermostat or the ability to regulate our temperature. So it is a, a, a viable option. I think probably one of the things is, that's um, maybe a downside to it right now is that it may not be covered under people's infor- insurance formulary. So the cost may be prohibitive. But the company that does manufacture the medication um, is offering a rebate program. So that you know may make it a little bit more affordable. Um, yes, Paul. No, no, that that was more so the silent signal to let Matt know I was going to talk next, but that's okay. I, I I wanted if we could, since we're on the subject of some of the non hormonal options, if we get maybe a little bit granular. So I guess the yeah. you mentioned the antidepressants. I feel like I see paroxetine as kind of a favorite, even though I hate that for almost every other intent and purpose, just in terms of discontinuation <laughs> symptoms and the libido crushing and some of the other issues with it. Um, I, I wonder if you would mind kind of going through your menu of the antidepressants that you would recommend. I know like, I feel like the, some of the SNRIs, I feel like I, Dr. Up to Date at least recommends for, for these symptoms, but what is your approach for the, sort of the, the psychotherapeutics for the vasomotor symptoms? Yeah, well, paroxetine is the only one that's FDA approved for managing hot flash or has FDA approval for managing hot flashes and night sweats. And I usually tell people, you know, we're using it at a a lower dose than what people typically would be on for depression. And so that means that the side effects may not be as severe, but I think you're right. If I have somebody who's one of their main symptoms is decreased libido and it's, it's stressful to them or bothersome to them, then I, I, you know, I've, I've, that's not the first thing that I'm kind of pulling out of my bag of tricks. Um, Venlafaxine is another that's used quite frequently. Um, one of the other things with paroxetine, if you have somebody that has a history of breast cancer and they're on tamoxifen, the paroxetine may, um, uh, you know, affect the the efficacy of, of their, their drug that they're on. And so, um, you know, that's a consideration. So for those patients, venlafaxine is usually my go-to. Um, and so, but that one also too can, can cause decreased libido. And so it's always weighing the pros and cons. So some people will say, oh my goodness, if these vasomotor symptoms were better and if I could sleep better, I think I could get it together with my libido. I'm willing to chance it. And then there are other people that say, oh my goodness, if that's even a potential that it could be a side effect, weight gain's another one. If, if it's even a potential that it could make me gain weight or make it harder for me to lose weight, then I don't want it. So it, it is things that we have to talk about. Some of the other antidepressants that don't cause weight gain or may not have the libido side effect don't work as well for the vasomotor symptoms. So, you know, if those are considerations, then it may not be that that's the option for that particular patient. And gabapentin does cause weight gain audience. We've talked about that before, or Ken and swelling, all sorts of, it's not, not a favorite of Paul's and mine, but I, I mean, for this, this is one of the times where sometimes I will try it, especially in the evening. It looked like the dose was fairly high, like between 900 and 2,400 milligrams a day seems like, you know, a high dose. Do you have success with lower doses just given like at night if that's when the most bothersome symptoms are? Yeah, I usually start pretty low at just 300 milligrams and we titrate up if we need to. Yeah. Um, and, and letting them know that this is, you, this is, you know, we're going to, I'm going to bring you back. I don't want to hit you with the kitchen sink right away. If mm-hmm. you are better with a lower dose, then I don't want to, you know, start out at the top. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we have ways to titrate up and see how you're doing. And sometimes a combination of things might be better for someone. And then the, I thought it was funny and also suspicious that the paroxetine that's FDA approved is like a special, you can only get, it's like a know. special paroxetine <laughs> salt, Paul, sure. and it's seven and a half milligrams versus the regular that we're used to prescribing for, you know, depression, anxiety is like the 10, 10 milligram or 20 milligram tablets. It's that two and a half milligrams, it makes all the difference. That's it, the, it, the secret sauce that makes that's it That's the secret effective. sauce. Yeah. So I give just know, the regular, the 10 milligram and we call I it a figure. day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we do, uh, audience, we talked about fezolinitin on another uh, previous episode. It looked like there was another neurokinase 3 inhibitor that was like they were studying and it had some liver damage. This one, they didn't really see that. But it's, you know, I when when I see that, I'm always like, if patients were coming to me asking about this, my counseling would be like, you know, it, as we roll this out, like we might pick up new side effects. Here's what we know so far. I'm not sure if you're Absolutely. if you have any experience yet with it, but 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm counseling patients. One, I'm looking at their medical history. So in particular, I had a patient recently that had a history of lupus, already had some renal insufficiency and a slight bump in her liver enzymes that weren't sure really what it was mm-hmm. about. I don't think that's the right drug for you. Um, mm-hmm. And even with fesalinotant, there were some patients that had a slight increase in liver enzymes. So it's recommended that you check baseline levels and then check again a few months after they've been on it just to make sure that they're, they're still good. So absolutely, I think the way that you just rolled it out is how I talk to my patients too, to mm-hmm. say it's a new drug, um, looks safe, looks efficacious. The data was good, but again, you know, um, things happen and headaches were another one. So people that are having issues with that have chronic migraines or mm-hmm. chronic headaches, that was one of the, the bigger side effects that were reported too. So, you know, it may not want to give somebody that's already having issues with headaches, a, a, a medication that may exacerbate that too. Mm-hmm. Well, this, but this is great. I mean, you're really, I, I always like when you can give the patient like a buffet of options of, of like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about lifestyle changes, ways you can eat, uh, exercise that'll improve your overall health, how losing weight can help with this. You said you talked to them about like cooling techniques and maybe a little bit of like, it sounds like almost like you're giving them a little bit of CBT tips, but, uh, I mean, do you ever refer out for that? I always find CBT is like, it works for everything, but it's very hard to access <laughs> in practice. So I, if you have any tips, but it does sound like maybe you're almost coaching your patients a little bit in how the CBT works. I do. And I, I kind of coach them through the same thing when we talk about using it for sleep disruption, because in my area, you know, usually not only are the vasomotor symptoms um, a bothersome to them, but if it's impacting their sleep too. You know, one of the mm-hmm. good things that came out of the COVID pandemic was that we really quickly pivoted to this online format. And so yes. there, there's a lot of things that now are accessible to patients from a virtual format um, that mm-hmm. maybe they didn't have access to before if they can't find a therapist in their area that, that specializes in CBT for menopausal symptoms, mm-hmm. then um, there's some access of being able to, to, to find people online too. Um, but there's yeah. some even some online resources that people can locate that they can teach the techniques to themselves too. That's not always ideal, but but it is helpful and it's something that they can do and it works. It's, I think I've even made this joke before, but just for those of you about to take your boards, if CBT is a choice of one of the answers, like it, that's going to be the correct answer, whatever, whatever the question is, you can probably just skip past. If you see CBT as an answer, just pick that one and move on through that. It's kind of the mind over matter though, right? It, it's, it's really, you know, talk, I call it talking myself off the ledge. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're able to like really, you know, understand what the concept is, it's, 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 it's trying to level set of saying, okay, how can I make this, how can I self-soothe myself out of whatever the troublesome thing Thing is that's going on right now with me. I should probably explore CBT. Um, <laughs> I I will say I have to, I can tell that Matt wrote this script um, in part because we got to the treatment before we got to the history of the examination. So I wonder <laughs> um, before we delve into sort of the, the hormone replacement part or sort of get too much deeper into the therapies, if we could maybe take a step back and I would love to hear sort of how you take um, a, a vasomotor history from a patient. You know, is there, are there any sort of a, scales that you use to kind of quantify things and track? Because I think so much of our treatment actually is sort of depends on the severity of the symptoms as well. So what what does the history sound like from you when you're taking from a patient who's reporting these symptoms to you? It's very, it was really personal because what is really bothersome to one patient may be not so much to another patient. Um, and so if somebody tells me that they have hot flashes I don't know, three or four times a week, but those three or four times a week are extremely distressful to them. I'm not going to withhold treatment from them. Likewise, somebody may tell me, oh, they happen a couple times a day, but it doesn't bother me that much. I just take my sweater off, you know, or I carry this cute little fan around with me and, uh, you know, and it strikes up conversation and they're smiling when they're telling you about it. So even though they're having them more frequently, it doesn't seem to be bothering them as much. So I I think that scales are good if you're doing research, especially if you're trying to quantify, uh, you know, whether or not the treatment that you're studying or that you're prescribing has good efficacy, you're comparing it with something else, and you're going to use that data later. In a clinical practice, though, I think you can just talk to the patients and really say, you know, you can find out what their most bothersome symptoms are, what's really troubling to them. And if they're telling you that they're having really bad vasomotor symptoms, I usually believe them. 
Uh, this, the, you know, the one thing that I think is so frustrating to patients that I see is that they may be still having a regular menstrual cycle. Let's say they're in their early to mid forties and they're having bad hot flashes and night sweats. They're starting to have mood swings. It's a pact impacting their personal and professional life. Um, they, they feel that there's some cognitive fogginess. You know, I, I feel like I've just got this brain fog all the time. I'm not thinking as sharply and I know it's got to be my hormones, but everybody keeps dismissing me because I'm still getting a regular period every month. And the reality is, is that we start having symptoms related to hormonal fluctuations up to seven, maybe even 10 years before you actually stop having menstrual cycles and fit the true definition of menopause. And oftentimes it's in that perimenopause transition or time frame rather that people are most symptomatic. And so validating what they're experiencing and then talking about how to treat them and improve their quality of life is just as important as the person that fits the definition of menopause because they may even be more symptomatic. Yeah, that's so you were just saying that because I was reading that on average, I think the once once women start with the menopausal symptoms, they tend to go for like seven years or something like that. Does that, so there, so there's like a long span, like if it's starting that far before and then that long after menopause, that's a, that's a long time to be going through this. And it's, it's variable though. So everybody's yeah. symptoms are different. It's not terrible for everybody. And I think that's the part that's, you know, we can't put everybody in the same bag too, or just mm -hmm. assume that it's bad. It really, because for some people it's mild symptoms and for other people, it's really debilitating. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think patients start to compare themselves. They'll say, you know, my, my, my sisters or my friends don't have it as bad as I do. Or they might be guilty. They might be the person that didn't have it as bad. And they're telling the people around them like, why are you so dramatic? It can't be that bad. And, and it, you know, it's different. It's just like when you're at the start of the reproductive cycle, people start having menarche at, at various ages. Some people are nine, some people are 16, and it's all normal. Some people are very fortunate. They get their periods. They come every 28 to 30 days. They only last three to five days. They're never really troublesome. And then one day they just stop and they just move on with their life. And then you have other people that from the moment they first get it, they hemorrhage every month, they're nauseated, they're throwing up and, and it's just badness until they hit menopause. And then you have everything in between. And so, you know, that's, I think that the hard part about managing menopausal patients is that especially because menopause is getting its day in the sun right now, everybody's talking about it. I read an article recently that said that it's a $600 billion industry that, that, um, that patients are spending about 2000 dollars a year on menopausal treatment. So everyone's trying to get on in on it. And it's making it as we move into our conversation about hormone therapy, it's making it seem like hormone therapy is the magic pill. It's the antidote to aging and that we doctors or we healthcare professionals have been withholding this, this really important treatment and give it to me. You know, that New York Times article was, I loved it, but it was like the bane of my existence. I was getting inundated with phone calls because her, I forget what the title was, uh, um, oh, yeah. we have I been misled, have right? We have been misled yeah. about menopause. And so- That's it. I don't think people are tricking anyone. And so there are some side effects that we need to talk to and everybody shouldn't be on hormone therapy. And unfortunately, I wish it was being a menopausal woman myself. I wish that it was the antidote to aging, but it's not. Yeah. Our, our first kind of question was like, has the pendulum swung too far away from prescribing hormonal therapy. And I was telling you beforehand that you, I, I sort of, when I went through med school, it was, it was pretty recently after the the WHI. So like that study had come out and scared a lot of people away from it and from using any hormonal therapy. And this New York Times article was just sort of saying like, why aren't doctors prescribing this more? It can be miraculous for people. And, you know, it, and, and it's not it's as one dangerous. one crazy trick about menopause your doctor's it's not, not telling you about. It's yeah, not great. as dangerous as everyone thinks. And it's like, you know, it's add another, add, an, add this to the list of things that doctors are withholding for me that I should be, I have access to. And I do understand both sides of that argument, of course. 
Um, it sounds like you're you're not necessarily calculating a score. It's more like, and this this kind of happens a lot, Paul. When we talk to experts, they're so used to taking the history, and they just have a gestalt about how severe symptoms are, and you don't really need like a a formal score. It sounds like, and and also you kind of told us that you sort of first you try lifestyle, you talk to them about non hormonal options, and then hormonal therapy is like maybe that, that at a follow up visit you talk to them about that. Am I putting too many words in your mouth or is that sort of the general approach? Yeah, no. And I, I, I think that the, the patients are going to come in and they're going to tell you what they've, many of them have already tried stuff before they yeah. came in, right? Or they're mm-hmm. going to tell you if they're really miserable, you're going to see it, right? You, you mm-hmm. know, it. And, and, and it's not our judgment really of how bad it is. It's really listening to them and seeing how much of a disruption to their quality of life these symptoms are causing them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly looking at, do they have other medical comorbidities? So your history is extremely important, just like for everything else. Are they um, a hypertensive that are on antihypertensives that might be um, adding to it? Do they have fibromyalgia or some other chronic pain syndrome and they're on um, uh, narcotic pain medications or muscle relaxants that also could be contributing to their perceived hot flashes and night sweats? Uh, you know, so uh, do they have an uh, underlying thyroid? Maybe everybody, all the women in their family have a thyroid disorder and she hasn't had her thyroid hormone checked and there's some underlying hypothyroidism that we haven't, you know, figured out. So absolutely getting that that history and physical that, or history that you would get for everybody is going to be really important. But when it comes down to just asking what symptoms are you ex- ex- experiencing and capturing that, uh, I think is, 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 is very personal to the patient. And they'll be able to tell you, they're going to tell you right away, what's the thing that's most bothersome? Yeah, doc, I'm having hot flashes, but it's this vaginal dryness that's killing me. It's, it, I can't have intercourse. It's extremely painful. And um, I can deal with that. I can't deal with this. And so then you'll be able to, you know, kind of talk to them about, mm-hmm. well, these are the treatment options and this is what's going to be taken care of. And so as we move into this hormone therapy conversation, right, you know, I think, um, you know, that women's health initiative trial was the thing that scared everybody, you know, it, 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 the, the trial was prematurely stopped because the people that were in the hormone therapy group had a, a higher risk of stroke and they had a higher associated risk of breast cancer and everybody was terrified and the media picked up on it and um, doctors were afraid to prescribe it and patients were afraid to take it and, and we had just a lull. And the reality was is that one, that trial was not looking at whether or not hormone therapy actually helped hot flashes and night sweats or symptoms associated with vaginal atrophy. We already knew that it helped those things. That was not what was being evaluated. What was being looked at was whether or not being on hormone therapy minimized cardiovascular risk. Because what we saw was that after menopause, the risk, a cardiovascular risk went up. And there were some small observational trials that looked like being on hormone therapy may actually be beneficial. And so they wanted to look at this on a large scale with our gold standard randomized control trial. So half the people got hormone therapy, half the people didn't get it. But the average age of the women in the study was almost 64. It was like 63 and a half. So these were people that were well past the onset of menopause. Many of them weren't even symptomatic anymore, and they just kind of took all comers. And so it's it, looking back on it, it's really not a surprise that the incidence of these other comorbidities went up. And so mm-hmm. when people went back and looked and we said, let's tease out, let's look at the younger people. Let's look at the women that were under the age of 60. Let's look at the people that were... Um, you know, within 10 years of the onset of menopause, and let's see if the risks were higher in them. And then re- the reality was, was that those people, actually, the the benefits outweighed the risk. And so, um, you know, there, that's where this timing hypothesis comes in. And so most people will say, if the patient is within 10 years of the onset of menopause, if they're under the age of 60, that there, it, without having any strong contraindications that the benefit in patients that are symptomatic, and we'll talk about what those symptoms are for when hormone therapy is recommended, that the benefits outweigh the risk. And so the, the four indications are moderate to severe hot flashes and night sweats, somebody that goes into premature menopause earlier than the age of 40, 
and we would put them on it to help until they would have reached the natural age of menopause, which is the early 50s. Um, and then the other is prevention, not treatment of, but prevention of osteoporosis and the genital urinary symptoms that, that can come from, from mm -hmm. um, after menopause, from hypoestrogenism. Uh, so, you know, when patients are coming in saying, no, I don't really have hot flashes or night sweats, but I've gained weight. Or, um, you know, um, my, my skin is getting wrinkled or thinner or my hair is thinner, um, or I just don't have the same energy that I had before. I want to be on hormone therapy. That's not really the indication. And actually it doesn't help with those things either. Yeah. I like you had a tweet that was, uh, hashtag HRT will not help you lose weight, prevent hair loss, stop wrinkles or halt the aging process. Don't kill the messenger. And uh, <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was well said. So with with this, we we want to talk a little bit about. Uh, of course, we want to talk about prescribing it. You mentioned comorbidities. You mentioned certain risk. What's your approach to that? We we talked about this um, after one of the conferences we went to in the spring, where the the speakers were talking about they how they assess cardiovascular risk and how they assess breast cancer risk and how that factors in. Do you have an algorithm that you use or like a standard line of questioning to assess for risk factors that would be a deal breaker for the patient? Yeah, very similar to when you're counseling a patient about being on contraceptive, um, hormonal contraceptives. So somebody that's had a history of a venothromboembolism, whether it be DVT, PE, those are going to be people that I'm going to pause. I, I really am not going to put you on something that's uh, hormones that are going to exacerbate the risk of recurrence. Now, there are some tr studies that did show that patients that are on full anticoagulation um, with vasomotor symptoms that that putting them on anti or putting them on hormone therapy didn't exacerbate their risk. So there may be some role for that, but I think people have to understand that that's still, you know, controversial. Um, anybody that has an estrogen um, derived uh, cancer, whether it be ovarian cancer, uh, endometrial cancer, or a uh, breast cancer are patients that, that are going to have strong contraindications to it as well. And there's some nuances that we can think of talk about, but, uh, but really for the, the, you know, general provider that that's seeing these patients, the the parting line is really probably those people should not be on hormone therapy, especially systemic doses of hormone therapy. And we're cowards, right, Paul? We wouldn't do yeah. that without <laughs> involving an expert anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so thinking about those same, you know, contraindications, you know, um, somebody that has um, ex uh, extreme cardiovascular risk, um, you know, those are people that are going to have a higher risk. So maybe using a transdermal option may not confer as much risk, but, uh, you know, that's some um, serious counseling that needs to go into it. And I think that we should have exhausted every non-hormonal option, and then had a real conversation because those people probably, some of the medications they're on and their underlying medical condition is probably contributing to way that they're feeling too. And it's not all just hormonal. Um, and so, you know, I think having those hard conversations with people too, because people want to feel better, but we also want to make sure that they understand that those potential risks could put them in a situation where they're, they're far worse off. So we we recount your your really thoughtful explanation of sort of how to think about hormone replacement therapy. And Ms. J is now less reticent than she was. Um, to, is that my framing it the right way? She's she's more ready to consider it. Why don't we say it that way? So she'd like to try hormone replacement therapy. Can you talk us through your approach to the menu of options? It seems like there's a bazillion different formulations, which I think is maybe the other thing that intimidates people and might keep them from prescribing it. So how? Do you have sort of a, a standard few choices that you start with or what's your general approach to sort of choosing a, an initial therapy? Yeah. So I like to explain to them that the, there's uh, two categories. There's systemic dose hormone therapy and there's more low dose local vaginal estrogen therapy. And the low dose vaginal estrogen therapy is going to be used for patients that really are only treating these genital urinary symptoms that are associated with menopause. So your vaginal dryness um, that could lead to pain with intercourse or bleeding with intercourse. Urinary symptoms are included in there too, frequency, urgency, recurrent urinary tract infections. And so 
the one of the good things about the low dose vaginal estrogen therapy is that there isn't much systemic absorption. So some of the risks that we are fearing um, with systemic dose therapy, we don't necessarily have to worry about. There's not a, a time frame of how long someone can can use it either. Uh, there's lots of options for vaginal estrogen therapy. There is a vaginal pill. There is a vaginal insert. There is a vaginal cream. Um, it used to be that we would tell people to use it every day for two weeks and then drop down to twice a week. I think most of us now say that you could probably just start out using it twice a week. I usually will explain to people that it takes about eight weeks for them to notice their maximum um, benefit. So don't quit after a week. Um, and then uh, there's a vaginal ring too that's really nice because the ring you just put in and it stays in place for 90 days for three months. The patient shouldn't feel it. Their partner shouldn't feel it at the end to three months, you just put your finger in, pull it out, throw it away, and put another one in. So there's lots of options for vaginal for vaginal est estrogen that's efficacious and it works for those vaginal symptoms. For our patient, though, it's probably not going, it's not, not probably, it won't help for her hot flashes and her night sweats. So we're talking systemic dose hormone therapy now. And so, with, and because our patient, I'm going to assume, nobody told me that she had a hysterectomy, so I'm assuming she still has her uterus in. Because she, she still does. has her uterus, then we are going to not only have to give her estrogen, but we need to give her progesterone to minimize the risk of hyperplasia and protect her endometrium. Uh, so there are options, combination doses where the estrogen and the progesterone come together. And sometimes that's much easier for patients to take and remember. Or we can split out, give them estrogen, and then supplement them with a different type of progesterone. So if we're looking at combination options for estrogen and progesterone, there is a pill option or a patch option. The um, pill options um, are, are, are many. And, and um, uh, one of the things, though, with uh, combination hormone therapy is that the doses are not as plentiful as if we're just giving estrogen alone. And so sometimes that's where it comes in, where if somebody needs tweaking or we think they might need a little bit more estrogen because their hot flashes are better, but they're still having them, right? And they're telling us, I can tell that this is working, but I need more. That's when we may have to start to talk to the patient about separating them out. Um, in terms of, I should go back to with, there is an oral pill that's back on the market now that's a combination of estrogen and a CIRM, a selective estrogen receptor um, modulator. And uh, the, the type of CIRM that's in this pill with the estradiol is basidoxaphene. Uh, it works really well. Patients really liked it. It had been off the market for a little bit because of a packaging issue, but but uh, more recently has been put back on the market. So those are the combination pill options. And like I said, there's a patch. For somebody that we feel like we need a different estrogen um, mode, we can do the estrogen separately. And then we have the option of doing it, it either a pill, it could be a, a gel or an emulsion that they rub into their skin daily. We can do it as a transdermal patch um, that they either change twice a week or once a week. Um, there are vaginal rings that are higher dose, not the low dose ring that I talked about before. There are two higher dose rings that are systemic dosing, and but they still work the same way. They're, they're put in the vagina and they last for three months. At the end of three months, you take it out. And then when we're going to treat them with progesterone, we can either use a progestin IUD, which is like one of my favorite things to do because you just put it in. They can't mess it up because <laughs> it's there. Um, it's great for patients that are having wacky perimenopausal bleeding too, because you can put that IUD in and for the vast majority of people, it'll stop their bleeding and they feel like they kind of beat menopause a little bit. Um, if somebody is not amenable to having an IUD put in or, or there's some other reason why we don't think it would be efficacious for them, maybe they've got a bicornuate uterus or they've got fibroids or something that would make it more difficult to putting it in, then we would give them oral progesterone. And so there's an option for them taking it just half the days of the month. If you do it half the days of the month, they're going to get a withdrawal bleed. And 
personal, my personal opinion, the best thing about menopause is that you're not getting a period anymore. <laughs> and so in my wacky mind, there is absolutely no way that I would sign up for still having a period after I, you know, got the menopause prize. That's my favorite thing personally <laughs> about menopause. And there's not many yeah. things to get excited about, but to me, that's one of them. Um, it's like the only prize, right? It, like, what, that's what is- <laughs> how I feel about it. So I'm not taking it, but, um, so otherwise we would give them, um, a progesterone pill that they would take every day. And that, that does for the vast majority of people, um, minimize that risk of breakthrough bleeding. So, okay. Lots of options. Yeah. So I want to summarize a little bit, then I want to get into some of the specifics. Um, okay. So if, if they, if they have a uterus, we have to of course prescribe estrogen and progesterone and, uh, there's combinations of the two, uh, which there's many different pill options, or there's a patch option uh, for the combination estrogen and progesterone. Progesterone. Uh, There's a combination estrogen and basidoxaphine, which is basidoxaphine is a CIRM. And then uh, that sounds expensive, by the way. Uh, Then there's there's estrogen comes in all sorts of forms. If you want to have a little bit more control over the dose, so you can do pill, uh, pills, there's gels, there's patches that change are changed once or twice a week for estrogen, or there's rings. And these rings are a higher dose than what we would use for just genitourinary symptoms. And and then for progesterone, we can just give an IUD if, if they're okay with that, or uh, we can give them pills. If they take the pills for just the partial month, then they're going to have withdrawal bleeds. But if they take it continuously, um, then they should not have bleeding. Um, and I think that's kind of where we're at. I, cause I do want to talk about dosing a little bit like in, or, or types of estrogen. I mean, is there, if I'm, if I'm approaching this, I know there's going to be a million brands of, of estrogen, but when I'm going to just prescribe estrogen, aren't there, there's like conjugated, there's estradiol and what else is there? Or what else do I need to know about that? And what's like a typical dose, um, that we, that we might prescribe. Hey, I just wanted to break in here real quick and mention that after the episode, Dr. Christmas shared with us some slides that she uses when she's teaching this topic. They have all the different formulations of estrogen and progesterone, the vaginal types, the transdermal, the oral, the rings, patches, what have you. So that's all there in the show notes. So check that out so you can see the the brand names, the generic names, the dosing range for all this. Uh, It was too much to get into on this episode, but it's a really nice supplement to the discussion that we're about to have here. Yeah. So some of it is going to come down, unfortunately, and this is, you guys know this probably even better than me being in, uh, is that it's what your insurance, uh, what's on your insurance mm-hmm. formulary. And that's sure. a bad answer. Um, but the good part about that is most of them all still work and they're all efficacious, but sometimes mm-hmm. it really is going to come down to what's covered under their insurance formulary. Um, that uh, CIRM that you talked about that you said it sounds expensive. Yeah, there's no generic of it. So you were right. <laughs> it is expensive. <laughs> However, um, the company that makes it does offer a rebate program that actually works really well as long as um, a patient's not on Medicare because you can't participate in those rebate programs. But when you bring that rebate card in or have it on your phone and they scan it at the pharmacy, it's good for a year. So I find that most people are able still to able to ac- access that option if they want it. Mm-hmm. There's only one dose of that one though. So it makes it pretty easy. You don't have to you know stress out too much about that. Um, lots of people are very excited nowadays about bioidentical hormones. And so, um, it just means that the molecular structure of the hormone is very similar to what your ovaries make. It's still not the same thing, but it's very similar. You know, I I think right now it's a marketing strategy or marketing ploy because you have a lot of compounding pharmacies or people that are making it sound like because it's a bioidentical, it is a lot safer and it confers the same risk. And many of these um, formulations that are compounded um, that are not FDA approved um, actually can be more dangerous because they, they don't have to undergo the stringent guidelines. And so people are actually, yeah. you know, maybe getting more than what they need and they have these super physiologic levels that increase their risk of blood clots or worse. So, um, but there are FDA approved bioidentical options and um, uh, estradiol is one. And so if patients want or feel very strongly about having a bioidentical option, there are FDA approved uh, 
options for that um, that work equally as well, but still confer the same risk. Uh, usually if somebody is, is um, getting both estrogen and progesterone, the progesterone actually does give some benefit too. So I usually will start I don't go to the highest dose. I usually start somewhere in the middle, depending on how severe, or how bothered they are by their symptoms. Because what I don't want to do is give them the lowest dose of something and then they get no benefit and think, oh, this is garbage. Um, and I want them to feel better. But I usually will start in the middle. And and that's th- that's usually for the vast majority of people fine for them. They 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 feel better. Um, I, I personally try to do a transdermal option because you don't get that first pass liver effect. And so they don't get that bump and clotting factors. And so theoretically, it should confer a lower risk of venous thromboembolism uh, and the associated risks that go with that, like stroke. <laughs> um, and so that would be our patches. It would be that um, transdermal cream or the ring. Uh, the patches are going to be extremely irritating to people if they have skin sensitivity to adhesive. So if somebody already knows, I don't do well with Band-Aids, um, my skin is really sensitive, they're not going to like the patch. It's going to cause itching. It's going to cause irritation. And it may even cause some skin discoloration that doesn't go away. And so if somebody already says that, I'm going to tell them right away, the patch is probably not the option for you. Um, even though they're meant to stick on really well, and they do stick on very well for people that are swimming a lot or um, uh, exercise really isn't a big problem because it still sticks on. But for people that feel like it, it's not going to stay on, I'm in my hot tub all the time or, um, you know, that, that, that adhesive <laughs> may not be good for them. But they might do, do well with the uh, transderm of the gel. Um, or the emulsion that you rub in the skin. That's it's daily. I do tell people though, and I see your cat in the background, Paul. But if you have small uh, pets that are maybe holding, or even small children, you want to let that that estrogen gel dry on your skin because there is evidence that it can transfer from you to the pet or the small child. Even some people, this isn't as severe, but people will tell me, Dr. Christmas, it just takes forever for it to dry. And I feel like I stain my clothes if I put it on in the morning and then I get dressed and it is daily. So those are small things, but they are considerations that you want to tell people when you put it on, let your skin dry or have long um, pants on or something so that you're not, it's not being transferred. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if that specifically answered. It's really hard versus to to say, just, I start with this one thing. I usually will say, okay, these are your options. The patient says, you know what? I take, I take pills for other things every day. It is not going to be cumbersome for me to take a pill. I'll just take it with my other ones. Then I'm like, great, we're going to find you a pill. Um, for people that that say, nope, no skin sensitivity. I'm, I'm never had any issues with band-aids. I like that transdermal option because depending on which one their insurance covers, it's either changed once a week or twice a week. That sounds perfect for me. And you're and you, they've got one that has estrogen and progesterone in it. That's what I want to do. So then we go mm-hmm. with that option. Um, for patients yeah. that love the ring and the IUD, then that's where we go. And it looked like there like a low dose for conjugated estrogen i saw like 0.3 milligrams per day and then the high dose is 0.625 milligrams per day for estradi- estradiol half a milligram per day is a low dose and a milligram per day is a high dose and then the patches have like a different scale so that seemed you know to me that seemed a little confusing but i guess if we're prescribing it we can just look at the the range of doses for the specific agent we're trying to prescribe and then decide if we want to go low dose, high dose, or medium dose if they have one available. Yeah. For, and, and what I didn't say is for people that don't have um, a uterus that you're not having to supplement the progesterone for, especially if it's a surgical menopause, you those patients tend to need a higher dose of estrogen. And so then I don't start them out. So if I have somebody that recently had, you know, I did their hysterectomy, their ovaries, and they came out with the uterus, and I put them into surgical menopause. I'm going to start them out at that that 
0.1 milligram dose, whether it's a transdermal patch at the highest or it's the, the, the gel has lots of options for dosing. So that's always a nice way because you can tweak it up or down. Um, but I'm mm. going to start a little bit higher for them because they don't have that synergy with the progestin and the estrogen. For people that still have a uterus, you're kind of getting some benefit from both. And for those patients, they often don't have to be at the highest dose. Oh, interesting. Okay. And you you mentioned this, um, I mean, this is a case variation that we did want to talk about a little bit was if like, how do the doses differ? Because if, if someone's prescribing oral contraceptive pills, you know, how does that differ from hormone therapy, like b by, based on the dose or the potency of what we're giving? Yeah. So when you're giving somebody birth control dosing, you are trying to block ovulation because you're, it's preventing pregnancy. When we're giving hormone therapy options, we don't need that high of a dose. We're not blocking ovulation. We're just trying to get them back up to a physiologic level so that their symptoms are abated, right? So it's a, a really different. So even for people that tell me, I could never take pills. It made me crazy or it, you know, um, made me nauseous. It's completely different, not the same dosing. And, and just because somebody didn't tolerate hormonal birth control does not mean that they won't be able to tolerate hormone therapy dosing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are, these would be totally different pills than that would be, this is a totally different pool of estrogen and progesterone pills and therapies uh, for the most part. I mean, you, you said the IUD, I guess the IUD would be the same for, for either indication. Is that, is that correct? Right. So the, the reason yeah. I brought up the progestin IUD was because the progesterone and the IUD is keeping that lining suppressed and thin. And so mm -hmm. we're using that for, uh, endometrial suppression. And then mm -hmm. if somebody were still to have hot flashes or night sweats, then we could supple, we could add estrogen to that, adding a transdermal mm -hmm. estrogen. And now we've got endometrial protection, but we're also stabilizing or, or, you know, giving them the estrogen so that they're in particular, their vasomotor symptoms are improved. Mm -hmm. So Molly, uh, Dr. Molly Hoybline, the uh, host of our Curbsiders Teach and uh, occasional co-host on this program she had sent a question about what if a woman was, let's say you had a 48 year old woman who's on oral contraceptives, uh, like combined oral contraceptives, and she's 52 years old. She doesn't want to get pregnant and she's not sure if she went through menopause. Like, how do you handle that, that patient who has been on OCPs and probably went through the transition, but we're not sure and would also maybe like to avoid the, the symptoms? So somebody at 48, I would say that the median age in menopause is about 51 and a half, 52. But the range that 90% of people will fall into is going through menopause between 45 and 55. And I guess a better way to say that is by 55, 90% of women will have met the definition of menopause. And so at 48, if she's not having any issues, um, I might try to see if she'd be willing to switch over to a progestin IUD just because being at that higher birth control dose of estrogen could increase their risk of stroke. Um, but if she's not a smoker, doesn't have poorly controlled high blood pressure or diabetes, is of a, a normal or average weight, um, and is like, nope, I've been on this, I feel fine on it, then I typically will say, well, we'll leave you on it until you're 55, and then we can and we can take you off at 55. And if you are um, experiencing troublesome menopausal symptoms at that time, then we can talk about hormone therapy. Some people want to just go straight to hormone therapy so that we just kind of transition them from the birth control straight to the hormone therapy. So I think that mm -hmm. would be the way to, to, to think about that and somebody that doesn't have any contraindications. And, and it, it's something that I reevaluate on an annual basis. So they have to come mm -hmm. in to get their prescription. I have to see their blood pressure. I need to see that they've gotten their mammogram. We talk about an updated family history. You know, nothing crazy has happened in the family in a year that might give me pause for this, you know, 50 year old to still be on combination birth control. Um, and again, I would ask them again about maybe being on an IUD if they would be willing to do that. And of course, I think for, for 
these patients that are perimenopausal or in that age range, having them on the lowest dose. So that's where those low dose, lowest dose birth control pills would be a better option than them being mm-hmm. on something that's higher dosed. Are those are those still higher than the typical hormone replacement therapy for yeah. like vasomotor symptoms? They are still, still different, higher. Okay. yeah. But because yeah. again, it, you know, it's still considered birth control, and you're trying to block ovulation so the person doesn't get pregnant. With hormone mm-hmm. therapy, we're not we don't need to block ovulation anymore. Um, so we're not trying to block ovulation. We just want to get them at a physiologic level, and so that's a little yeah, different. yeah. And what about the woman that, um, like, let's say you have a, a 32 year old who goes through, uh, who, who has prime, uh, primary or premature ovarian insufficiency. What about the dosing there? And, uh, you know, how long would you continue hormone replacement therapy? I know it's a different, it's a, t- it's a different situation than using it for vasomotor symptoms, but how, how would the approach differ? Yeah. So, um, so that I guess the difference we'll say is if you're premature menopause, then they're definitely in menopause. They're hitting the definition of menopause. Um, they're not having menstrual cycles anymore. The ovaries are not producing any hormone. Um, mm-hmm. and so for those patients that are under the age of 40, that, and that's the definition of premature menopause, we, we, it is, unless there is a strong contraindication, those patients absolutely should be on hormone therapy and they should be on hormone therapy up up until the point that they would have reached natural menopause, so about age 52. Uh, they should be on a higher dose uh, of estrogen to help. Uh, and the purpose for putting them on is because we want to minimize their risk of developing osteoporosis in the future. We want to minimize their cardiovascular risk, and we also want to minimize the risk of cognitive decline. And so they should be on at least 0.1 milligrams of estradiol. Um, now, People get confused though, because they'll say, well, wait a minute, if everybody should be on it, if it's going to minimize those risks, if it's minimizing cardiovascular disease, if it's minimizing osteoporosis, if it's going to help me not get dementia in the future. The problem is, is that in, in, that it hasn't been shown in older patients to actually minimize those risks. And so it, it isn't even a cumulative effect like, oh, we should all just be on this. And there actually is evidence that um, for patients over the age of 60, that the associated risk of dementia and cognitive decline are higher uh, on hormone therapy. Um, and, mm. and as we know from the WHI trial that we talked about earlier, we are not using hormone therapy to minimize cardiovascular risk. This is only in women that are under the age of 40 that go through menopause. Um, primary ovarian insufficiency means that those, that ovarian function is waxing and waning. And so for those individuals, they still might get periods and they still might, albeit not every month synchronized, they might still ovulate. And so somebody that has POI or primary ovarian insufficiency, one, we want to make sure do they want, if they don't want or desire pregnancy, then they should actually be on birth control, um, so that because it, it's not unheard of or unusual that they could get pregnant. Um, so they, they probably, we wouldn't put them on, um, on hormone therapy yet. Now, usually what happens is at some time point, they move from being in ovarian insufficiency to going into menopause. And so then um, hormone therapy would be beneficial then. But if it's POI, it's usually patients are being put on birth control. I was not realizing there was a distinction. I was thinking it was just like, you know, a woman uh, under 40 just stops having periods and you test and her LH, LH and FSH are through the roof and you're just like, oh, I guess you're in menopause for whatever reason. Um, you're saying there's a difference between the woman who just sort of has like amenorrhea um, it, it, at a young age. Uh, how, how do you clinically differentiate? I, I, I'm not sure if I'm following. Yeah, so- Premature menopause would either be that they have um, had not had a period for a full year or Mm -hmm. they have labs six months apart that put them in a menopause range. Usually the way you can tell the difference with with primary ovarian insufficiency is that um, 
the periods are changing. They're spacing out. They're irregular. So you may check an FSH in particular or a follicular stimulating hormone level in estradiol. And sometimes what you may see is that that FSH level is borderline or it's high. It's in the menopausal range. And they might still have estrogen though. And it's kind of weird. You're mm-hmm. like, wait a minute, the estrogen is not less than 10. They still, why, why do they have a, a higher estrogen, but their FSH and their periods are irregular. And so it's waxing and waning. It's kind of coming and going. And so so um, because, and, and they're still having periods, although they may be irregular. So they haven't met that definition of not having a period for a full year. Uh, I see. Um, and their labs may be suspicious, like elevated or borderline FSH or, um, you know, you're, we're starting to say something's not quite right here, but, but their ovarian function, again, isn't, hasn't, isn't stopped. They're not depleted. They still have some follicular reserve there. And with premature menopause, it's nothing. Their FSH is high. Their estradiol is zero. They haven't had a period. And there's not really, you know, um, uh, you know, there, there's no uh, thought that, that this person could get pregnant. So we're not putting them on birth control. We're putting them on hormone therapy. Hormone therapy. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. So Monica, let's, let's circle back to Ms. J. <laughs> um, we, she's, let's, she, we, let's put her back at, she's now 55 years old. So for, just to remind you, that's, I, I think seven years after we initially started treating her and she's been doing much better on, um, hormone therapy, but she still has a few hot flashes, a couple, a few times weekly that are quite bothersome. And as a result, she'd like to continue the therapy because she does think it's helping, but she wants to know if it's still safe. So Ms. J's question, and I think our question for you is how long um, can we use hormone therapy for in this type of patients, for the patient who does not have primary ovarian insufficiency or early menopause, that we've started it for these vasomotor symptoms? How long do we treat them for? And you know, how long is safe? So it used to be that we told people that they could be on it for five years, and then we just yanked it away. Um, and most of us are not doing it anymore. And that, and you said, well, why it was five years just random? Where did five years come from? <laughs> right? Did you just pull, <laughs> you just I mean, pull just that out? Sense. And so the five years came from really that the symptoms are typically the most severe. And this comes from the SWAN data, study of women's health across the nation. Um, some other, the bigger trials too, but it comes from um, uh, longitudinal study trials that show that the symptoms are typically most severe, most bothersome around the initial five years after the final menstrual period. And that for even people that that don't go on treatment, that the symptoms tend to get better on their own. And for the vast majority of people, they go away. There, there's a small percentage of people, my mom happens to be one of them, that I call chronic flashers. She's continued to have them. <laughs> I'm not going to say her age because she would disown me. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so now we don't yank it away at five years, but we are, it, it, the, the pause comes in if you are over the age of 60 and you are more than 10 years from the onset of menopause, the risks the start to outweigh the benefit. And that's when we're really having a, a serious conversation with people because as I shared, the the associated risk of breast cancer goes up, the um, risk of cognitive decline and dementia um, may be more of a factor at that time that's not, a, you know, as, as a consideration in younger um, people. And so, you know, do I have to take it away from them? Is there something magic? You turn 60, you can't have this prescription anymore. I don't do that. Um, because there's some people that tell me, Hey doc, I got to die from something. And if I'm going to die from my hormone therapy, so be it. I feel like I, I'm much more energetic. And I, I think that I look younger than my contemporaries and I, it, it, it's not the hormone therapy. Most of those people are also avid tennis players and they're meticulous about what they choose to fuel their body with. And so, yeah, they look great, but it's, it's not necessarily a hormone therapy that's doing it for them. Um, but I will then tell them, well, I want you on the lowest dose and I would prefer you be on a transdermal if they're not on a transdermal option. And then we do talk about it. Sometimes I'm, I'm able to get people to just stop the systemic hormone therapy and go down to a vaginal option so that they don't have the pesky vaginal symptoms. Because remember, we don't have to have a time constraint on that. 
Uh, if they are have a, and there's going to be a recurrence of the hot flashes for a minute or two or three after they stop the hormone therapy, um, it usually subsides. But if it's really bothersome, we can talk to them about some of the non-hormone options. And if they really feel like, nope, I want to be on hormone therapy, they're coming in annually, we're doing their annual mammograms, they don't have any other strong risk factors. I usually will leave them on it. I'm not saying that that's the right answer, (laughs) Um, but I think that it does. There is some autonomy in this, and I think it's individual. The vast majority of people, the risks scare them. And they, you know, especially when you, people will say, oh, well, it's, it's no higher than drinking a glass of wine or it's no higher than being obese. Well, what if you have somebody, though, that's a little bit overweight and they do like a glass of wine with dinner? And they're on hormone therapy. Well, what do we do with that risk? Is it compounded? And so I do think that people are really mindful of that and they understand it. Um, you know, they want to feel better, um, but they do understand that that hormone therapy isn't the magic pill. And then, and I think it's important when we're putting somebody on it to tell them this is not forever, right? I'm giving it to you now, but you know, eventually we're going to talk about when we come off of this. And most people are pretty reasonable about it and say, yeah, I understand that. Thanks for letting me know that. It, it sounds like there are patients out there that would want to uh, ha- at least have that conversation. And especially if we're, if people are going, moving back more towards starting it, I think this conversation is going to be more common than it probably is right now. And it's documenting all of it. Every year she's came in, we talked about it. I've documented yeah. these risks. I mean, cause I think, you know, what I don't want to happen is I have somebody on hormone therapy that is well past the time we'll say that should have been. And now all of a sudden, and because the risk of breast cancer goes up just with age in general. And so it may not have anything to do with the hormone therapy, but they now have a breast cancer because the first thing the oncologist is going to say is, oh my gosh, who is this Dr. Christmas that's been prescribing you estrogen (laughs) at 0.3 milligrams all this time? You're 75 years old. What is she doing? And The oncologist, it's fair. They can say that because that's true. But what I want the next thing to happen is the patient to say, no, Dr. Christmas has counseled me. She's been trying to take this away from me for the last 10 years. And I did and I did understand the risk. And, um, you know, that's something Mm -hmm. that I knew. And I understand that because I think that that's that humbleness of medicine and the imperfection. And, you know, yeah. People get to be the boss of themselves for certain things. Now, once they have the breast cancer, you're not getting the prescription from me anymore. <laughs> you know? All right. Well, I think we definitely should go to take home points. I'm sure we could keep you for another hour, but we shouldn't. Uh, and this has been fantastic. So uh, a couple take home points that you want the audience to remember about this topic. One, uh, menopause is ubiquitous. If you live long enough um, and you were born uh, with ovaries, I should say, um, you're going to go through menopause, right? That the, it, it is, it is. You can't outpay it. You doesn't matter what race, ethnicity you are, how rich or poor you are. Fifty percent of the population goes through menopause. It's a natural process, um, and um, it is. It is inextricably tied to the aging process. And so um, I have to remind myself of that because it's very easy to want to compare your 55-year-old self to your 25-year-old self. And that's never going to be a fair comparison. We're not going to ever be 25 again. And um, and I don't have any pill that's going to make somebody feel that way again. And so... Th- that's really how I like to say that this isn't good or bad. It just is. And when we're, you know, what we were able to get away with when we were on the underside of 50 isn't what we're able to get away with on the upper side of 50. And so diet matters, exercise matters, our self-care matters, um, you know, just overall mental well-being. And that's a that's a bigger part of managing this menopause transition than even the medicines that we may be able to give people. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great point. I love how as somebody who is also a surgeon that you're also so like, you know, talking to patients about like primary care. T- this is like a lot of primary care stuff that you're doing uh which is which is fantastic and I'm sure our audience will appreciate that part of how you approach the care of your patients. Anything that you would like to plug? Uh, I know you do 
a, a lot of different things. Uh, your Twitter is great, so people should follow you on there. I'll give that one. But anything else you'd like to plug? One last shameless plug. I'm working on an a international project that was uh, started by Professor Martha Hickey out of uh, Australia. But we are doing a menopause priority setting partnership. And I don't know if you've heard of these PSPs before. They have them for over 100 other medical conditions. But mm. it is where... We go to the people that have the lived experience, and in this case, it's menopause, and we're asking mm -hmm. the people, the professionals that treat the patients with menopause, and we're asking them what their priority questions are, what they want research to answer. As a practitioner, what are you seeing on a daily basis about menopause or this menopause transition that you can't answer or we don't have a fix to? So we're surveying them, and this is going to come out soon. It's called MAPS, Menopause Priority Setting Partnership. Um, and we are internationally, globally trying to survey as many people as we can. If there is a question or an answer that's already been answered, let's say it's about does hormone therapy help vasomotor symptoms, well, those questions are thrown out, right? We only want the questions that truly haven't been answered. And then we have this consortium meeting um, with involving people with the lived experience, healthcare providers, researchers, and we come up with a top 10 priority list that then fuels the research priority um, forthcoming. And I think that this is so exciting. Like I said, it's never been done for menopause before, but there's so many things that we don't know, especially with transgender individuals. How is hormone therapy in those, um, that patient population, how does it impact the menopause? Um, does it um, increase their risk for other things later in life that maybe we don't know about? Do they have a different trajectory than, than um, not? Um, you know, so there's so many, I don't even want to put questions out there because I want people to come up with their own questions, but we will um, be blasting it on social media, lots of different partners and other uh, major uh, menopause organizations uh, globally are uh, supporters and we'll be distributing the access link to um, people that members are in their, their, their community. So that's my, my plug about maths. Fantastic. That sounds like a great idea, a way to, to get research questions. That's that's a really smart idea. All right. Well, we will we will let you go. Thank you again so much for all your time in teaching. And we'll have to think of a reason to have you back for okay. a third time in the future. All right. All right. Take care. Good night. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yes, it has, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Hoist by my own petard. <laughs> Still hungry for more? Join our Patreon and get all of our episodes ad-free, plus twice monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find our show notes at thecurbsiders.com, and while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, which includes our Curbsiders Digest, which recaps the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value, practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So you can email us at askcurbsiders at gmail.com. We also want you to sub subscribe, rate, and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts, really. That does help. A reminder that this and most episodes are available through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. You can claim your CME there. And a special thanks to our whole team uh, who helps us write and produce the show. Our technical production is done by Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Krista Chu Manchu is the moderator on our Discord. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Guado. And as always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, thank you and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>